Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Conquer the Gauntlet Pro, Evan Preparis, and this week we're going to do something a little bit different. So I'm in upstate New York. I'm in a hotel with a lot of flies, which is super annoying because every time I come back into my room, I need to kill like three or four flies and pretty crappy internet. So because I don't have good internet, I don't want to schedule a call with someone and then have them drop off multiple times and kind of have it turn into a big mess. So what I decided to do was post on my Facebook and on the Strength and Speed Facebook page. You know, if you have any questions, hit me up and I'll answer them on air, read your name, and we'll kind of do like a little Q&A session uh, on the week before OCR World Championships. So a bunch of people posted questions, so I'm basically going to start at the top and uh, run through them. Before we get into that though, as always, you can head over to teamstrengthspeed.com and Get yourself some good discounts. We have discounts from RecBag, SS10 gets you 10% off. We have discounts for Mudgear. Um, you can pick up my book off that site. There's a code on there for Hammer Nutrition. So if you're looking for some endurance supplements, whether you're getting ready for OCR World Championships or World's Toughest Mudder, code 240887 gets you 15% off your first order only from HammerNutrition.com. And if you want some advice on what specific product you should pick up, uh, depending on your race, race length, feel free to hit me up on Facebook. And then finally, we added a discount section for higher-end products. Uh, so currently, there's only one product in there. It's the Hypoxico Altitude Tent. So if you're a very serious athlete looking to really take things to the next level, you can uh, pick one of those up. They're a couple thousand dollars, heads up, but there's some contact information on there, and we can get you a discount uh, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're looking at going pro and, you know, really competing for that top prize money or, you know, if you ran Tahoe a couple weeks ago and found out that the altitude kicked your butt pretty hard. Uh, it is a serious investment, though, so don't advise everyone goes in there and buys one. Uh, you really need to be putting in the time, effort, and um, have money to spend to pick up something like that. Anyway... We're going to start running through some of these questions. So I'm going to start with the first one that was posted on the uh, Strength and Speed Facebook page, and it's from Laura Hine McElduff. So let me apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name over the course of this episode. But uh, Laura asked, tell us about your workout balance in a typical week or a typical cycle, how much running and what types, what kind of strength training, and what obstacle-specific training, if any, you add into the mix. So I'm going to answer this specific to me, but I think it's important to note that any athlete, when they're setting up their training for obstacle course racing, should look at their background in sports and tailor it appropriately moving forward. So if you were a cross-country runner in high school and a cross-country runner in college, and now you're getting to obstacle course racing, your running's probably pretty good. So you probably want to do a lot more strength training than the average person. Or if you were, you know, a climbing guy who, who's been climbing for a decade and now you're getting into obstacle course racing, you're probably want to go, going to want to go a little bit heavier on the run side. So it's really important to look at your own personal background and adjust from there. I know we look at a lot of the top athletes. Like you hear, I've heard Hobie Call puts in really low mileage, uh, what I would consider really low mileage, like 20 to 30 a week and still performs at an inc- insanely high level, right? But again, he has a very deep background in running, so he can get away with that, and he does a lot more weight vest training and stuff like that. Uh, we interviewed him in the back of my book, Strength and Speed's Guide to Elite Obstacle Course Racing, and if you want to read more about his training, you can pick up a copy off my website. All right, so let's get into the question. So on a typical week for me, I do running five to six days a week and I do strength training four to five times a week. Now my running 
most of the days are easy. So I'd say, you know, two days are pretty easy runs of moderate length. So for me, anywhere between six and probably 10 to 12 miles. I do one um, VO2 max interval workout. So very hard running, but at a very short distance, trying to work on my, you know, my, my top end speed there. One lactic threshold workout, so longer intervals. So the VO2 max ones are short. They're like between 200 meters and 1,200 meters in length. And the lactic threshold runs are typically a little bit longer. So one mile to maybe even all the way up to three miles in length. So really trying to work on that, sustaining that hard pace, uh, but for a longer time. And then I do one, at least one really long run. So um, we'll call it, you know, 12 plus miles. Typically, I don't really go higher than 20 or 22. And when I'm prepping for something specific, like World's Toughest Mudder or OCR America or something on the very high end of an endurance scale, I try to do back-to-back long runs. So I'll do a back, you know, long run Saturday and a long run Sunday. And that allows me to cover a large distance and have a physiological adaptation without completely destroying my body, right? And so instead of just going out there and slogging through, you know, 35 miles on my own and, you know, my knees are shot and I'm mentally exhausted and, you know, it takes a big toll, you know, it takes me several days to recover. Um, I can do two long runs back to backs, you know, whatever, 15 and a 15 or a 20 and a 20, take a day off and then go right back into my training the next week. So running uh, four to five, I'm sorry, five to six times a week, Uh, strength training, usually, you know, three or four or four to five. And for obstacle specific work, I try to have one of my easy runs be an obstacle run. So I'll do a one to two mile warm up and then find some place with like a playground or there's a, there's actually a high school near me that has a low, has a little obstacle course. So I'll, I'll do warm up and then basically run a quarter mile, do an obstacle or two, run a quarter mile, do an obstacle or two. And I kind of repeat that until I hit whatever my target mileage is for the week or I'm sorry for that day. And the goal of there is to kind of get your body used to going from running to obstacles, back to running, back to obstacles. Now, I know a lot of people, you know, like to do these workouts where it's, you know, you're doing all sorts of, we'll call it metabolic conditioning workouts. So you're going from, you know, squats to jumps to sandbag cleans to monkey bars to, you know, you're you're bouncing back and forth between all these different exercises because the logic is that's simulating obstacle course racing, which I agree with. And I think doing at least one of those workouts a week is a good idea. However... I would caution against doing that for every single workout of the week because if you're always doing that type of workout where you're, you know, bouncing back and forth, you know, you're, you're never going to push your body to its limit on strength and you're never going to push your body to its limit on speed because when you go to do strength training or obstacle specific work, you're tired from the running and when you go to do speed training or running, your body is tired from the obstacles. So I like I do with a lot of my other, you know, logic based approach to training, I look at other sports and see how they train. So triathlons, triathletes don't swim, bike, and run at every single workout. Um, they do a lot of swimming by themselves, they do a lot of biking by them as a, as a standalone workout, and they do a lot of running. But then typically once or twice a week they add in a brick workout. So it's, you know, swim bike or bike run. So they kind of get you used to that transition. So similar logic applies. Now uh, you can also look at something like a baseball player. So in a game, a baseball player has to swing it, swing his bat, and then run around the base. So he, when he practices, he breaks apart the running and the swinging the bat practice. So he can get a lot of reps in for swinging, and then to get some reps in for running, and then he puts them together. So try, I try to take that same logic and approach it to obstacle course racing. So I want to do my strength training. By itself, a lot of the times, to really kind of work on that max strength. My run training by itself, a lot of the times, to really work on that max speed. And then a couple times a week, I want to put it all together to get my body used to transitioning between run and uh, obstacles. Kind of dragging on here, but let's see what was the last part of the question. What obstacles to training, if any, do you add into the mix? So ideally, uh, with all training, we want three things 
we want three things to be involved in our training. We want it to be specific, we want it to be enjoyable, and we want it to be progressive. So let's start off with specific. So if you want to get better at something like rigs or something like sandbag carry, the best way to get better at whatever that obstacle is is to practice that specific obstacle, right? So you're, you're honing in on specificity there. Second part, um, you want it to be enjoyable. Everyone enjoys different things. You know, like some people like CrossFit. I come from um, a natural bodybuilding background, so I still like to train a lot with weights. Um, so you want it to be enjoyable because if you enjoy it, you're going to put in more effort naturally. And then the third part is you want it to be progressive. Now, progressive means it gets harder as you get better. I think a lot of people with doing a lot of body weight training or, you know, if you only have a sand, one sandbag that you can't add weight to, you quickly find that, you know, you, you hit a certain level of your workout and then your body starts stagnating because it's not getting progressive. So to make it progressive, we can do things like add weight vests, we can add number of reps, we can add, we can lower the rest intervals. Um, let's do a couple of specific examples. So a warped wall. Let's say you have a warped wall in your, ninja, your local ninja gym. You know, how do you make that progressive? Because the wall is only one height. You can't adjust the size of the wall unless they have a tiered wall system. But assuming they only have one size wall, we'll go with that. So to make, so that's going to be specific because it's, that's something you'd encounter in a race. Um, I'm assuming it's enjoyable because you're there. Uh, it's an obstacle, right? And we all love obstacle course racing. And to make it progressive, you can do things like instead of backing up all the, as far as you can before the run-up, you can get closer to the wall and see how close to the wall you can get and still make it up. Uh, you can do things like add a weight vest. Now, adding, you want to add stuff slowly, right? So you want to add like five pounds and prove you can get up with that first before you start throwing on a 40-pound weight vest and try running up a wall because that, that's a good way to get injured. So with all weight vest training, you know, tiny, tiny additions of weight so your body adapts slowly um, and you don't hurt yourself. I feel like I strayed a little bit off topic there, but um, what obstacles? Are, okay, back to the sorry, back to the specific question. Back to the question at hand. What obstacles specific training you do? So, f for me personally, for my workouts, I always start off with something very obstacle specific that I think is my weak points. So, a lot of times, I'll start my workouts workouts off with pegboard practice. Pegboards are real hard, so I, I always like to keep up. Keep sharp on that skill, especially with Conquer the Gauntlets Pegatron um, being such a deciding factor in a lot of races. So I'll typically start, you know, with going across the pegboard maybe for as long as I can, and then I follow it up with another, you know, four shorter, shorter movements. So you know, the first one I'm up there for a minute or maybe even a little bit longer, and the next couple of you know pegboard movements I'm up there for I don't know 30 seconds or something like that. So really honing in on that specific workout. Another one I like to start off my workouts with is rig work. So I'll bring in to the gym, which has a set of monkey bars, I'll bring in atomic climbing holds with uh, fabric loops on them, and I basically build my own rig in the gym, and I practice traversing it. And I'll change up the order of the holds. I will um, focus on my weaknesses. So I can't even remember the last time I fell off a ring or a bar, so I try not to practice rings and bars very often, which means most of my training involves nunchucks, um, cannonballs or bombs, whatever you want to call them, and weird shaped things from Atomic like ice cream cone holds and bananas, so stuff like that. Um, so typically I start off my workouts with those, with something blue course racing, and I can no longer do you know crossings of the rig it'll be get it'll get a little less specific but it's still focused right so when i'm doing back workouts when i do pull-ups again i use atomic climbing holes instead of just a bar because again i can't remember the last time i fell off a bar um when i'm doing lat pull down machine so i'm, I'm training usually in a, in a normal gold's gym type atmosphere instead of using the bar on the lat pull down machine i put a nunchuck on there so i'm pulling i'm I'm getting my hand used to that vertical grip, that specific movement that I have to use for obstacle course racing. So, and that's pretty much it. I mean, I focus, I try, I try to focus mainly on my weaknesses and try to get better at them before uh, going on to other exercises that have less, less of a crossover uh, with OCR. I think, I think that covered the question pretty good. 
hopefully uh, that kind of answers things. But we'll move on to the next topic. How long have I ever run in my mouth for? 14 minutes. That was a long question. Okay. We'll try to move a little bit faster for the next one. So uh, Jared Renier wants to know, have I discussed my taper techniques in depth? Um, I don't think I have. So for tapering, so by the time you listen to this, OCR World Championship will be right around the corner. So if you haven't started tapering, start tapering. Um, my tapering changes depending on the importance of the race. I typically list things as A races, B races, or C races. So A race is something very important and something I'm going to taper for for three weeks. Uh, really let my body peak and get to its best possible condition. Uh, typically do an A race two to three times a year. So for me, it's usually world's toughest mutter and maybe one other thing or two other things throughout the year. And they're separated by months. B race is something I think is important, so I'll do like a two-week taper for that. Um, and then C race is usually no taper or maybe you know like a day or two um because i race so often i can't do a full taper for every race so i'm not going into every race performing at 100 percent of my ability and i know that and when i make my schedule i understand that at the beginning of the year you know if you go in and you expect to be at 100 percent of your potential at every race and you think you can race you know three to four times a month you're going to be disappointed with some of your results but as long as you have an understanding going in that some races are going to go better than others, um, I think that's fine. That being said, um, I generally try to cut volume by a third. So let's say let's do like a, look at a three-week taper, right? So I'll cut volume, running volume by a third every week leading up to the race, and then I typically take two rest days before the actual race. I always take two rest days before. I feel like it lets my body recover pretty good. And I usually don't feel sluggish on the starting line. The important thing you want to know is really for any race, those last two weeks, you're really not going to make any significant gains. So if it's an important race, definitely taper for at least two weeks. You're more likely to show up to the start line, you know, injured or exhausted uh, if you try to, you know, train real hard right up to the last minute. I know there's been some stories of some elite marathon runners who end up getting sick the month before their race, and then they show up and they're like, oh, I know I'm going to have a bad race, and they run a PR, right? Because they were training their body so hard that last month uh, when they were sick, they weren't running, and it allowed them to recover a lot a lot better. Uh, and then so it also, it also depends not only on the, you know, if I lifted an A, B, or C race, but also the type of race, right? So... For something like a warrior dash, where I'm not, I don't think I'm going to fail any obstacles because you really can't. I don't. I, I will tr strength train usually up until Wednesday, maybe even Thursday before a race. Um, but for something like a conquer the gauntlet, I'll stop strength training probably a Tuesday before the race. And for something as serious as world's toughest mutter, right? That's my pinnacle race of the year. I will stop strength training. A week and a half to two weeks out, and really just let all let all those muscles heal, let those uh, joint you know nagging injuries just kind of calm down a little bit, and then uh, show up on race day, you know, essentially mentally fresh and ready to go. Because you don't, I don't think most people realize how much of a mental toll it takes, you know, to get up every day and go for that long run, or you know, head head to the gym for a two a day or something like that. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers Jared's question. Um, Brian Fisher says, I know you touched on this in your book, but how about talking about nutrition during an endurance race? What do you eat before, during, and after? So during an endurance, let's go before, before an endurance race, I try to have a breakfast, something similar to my normal breakfast. So I usually have like eggs whites, egg whites or Ezekiel toast or yogurt or some oatmeal. Um, I usually eat a little bit less food before a 24-hour race because I've usually eaten a couple, a little bit more food on the week leading up um, to try to fill my glycogen stores. So I'm, I'm starting off with you know full muscles that are full of energy. So I would say for most people, eat, eat what you normally eat, uh, but eat a probably a little bit smaller quantity because your body is not going to want a, a heavy meal before a long race. But you do want something in your stomach because you don't want to start out uh, empty. 
I know my sponsor, Hammer Nutrition, recommends not eating for three hours before a race. Uh, I've tried that before, and I don't. I'm just not a fan of it. Um, I feel like I come in hung. Sometimes I'll come in hungry, so I, so I typically, I personally do not do that. Um, so then during, so I'm assuming we're talking about multi-lap events like Toughest Mudder or World's Toughest Mudder. So my my plan is pretty much the same, and it's worked for me. I like to err on the side of eating too much rather than eating too little. Because if you think about it, you're running for, like think about how much you would normally eat during an 8-hour span of the day or a normal 24-hour span of the day. And then now add in exercise on top of that, right? So you're burning, you're naturally, just by staying alive, right, your, your resting metabolic rate, you're naturally burning all this energy and now add in exercise on top of that, right? So your body's just burning through calories. So I'd rather eat a little bit too much because I've never finished an ultra race and been like, man, I shouldn't have eaten so much. I'm, I'm so full still. Like, I always finish and I'm like, I'm exhausted. Um, and I think that's part of the reason, personally, that I remain so consistent uh, for all these ultra OCRs. So if you look at my, if you look at every ultra OCR I've done, I've finished outside the top ten twice. Uh, I finished thirteenth in my first world's toughest and 22nd in my second world's toughest. Everything else has been, you know, 10th, 10th, seconds, firsts, thirds, uh, stuff stuff like that. Um, And I think think that fueling, you know, I go in there with the mindset of if I can fuel my body consistently, I can essentially run forever. And while that's not 100% true, I like to think that's true. And as we, most people know, you know, mental agility and mental flexibility and your mental strength plays such an important role during these races. So let's take a World's Toughest Mudder race. Um, Right before the start, 15 minutes before the start, I have a gel. So I get some final, like, kick of sugar into my system. And then I run my first lap, five miles. And then every time I come through the pit, it's the same plan. I drink a water bottle with two scoops of Perpetuum, Hammer Nutrition's carb fat protein blend. And then I take a, like essentially a Ziploc bag that has two two to three gels in it. And then Enduralite's Extreme, so Hammer Nutrition's um, electrolyte replacement. And then while I'm out on the course, I eat two to three of those gels. In general, I stay away from caffeine for the first half of the race. And then the second half of the race, I start adding caffeine. And I stay away from it against the first half of the race because people typically start out too fast. And I'd rather start out a little bit too slow than a little bit too fast. So that kind of prevents that. And then as you get more tired, the caffeine will make it feel easier. So it reduces your rate of perceived exertion and allows you to push a little bit harder. So I start, you know, and not only that, it's also a mental boost, right? So you start taking caffeine, you're like, I should feel energized. So it should... It should physi- physiologically it should hit you, but also mentally it should hit you that you should be running faster, and that allows me to push hard during the second half of the race, which again is why I think I run typically fairly even splits. I for for toughest mudder I've run even or actually slightly negative. Um, for world's toughest it's usually a little bit positive. It's it, I would say a little bit. It's positive. It's definitely a positive split. So my second half of the race at world's toughest is definitely slower than my first half, um, but there's very few people who can run a negative split at world's toughest. Um, probably can count them on one hand. And then after a race, uh, I, again, I try to eat healthy, but I usually, especially for a 24-hour race, I like to, you know, indulge in something. So my go-to post-race treat is double-stuffed Oreo cookies, uh, which I only eat after events. And if we're in Vegas for World's Toughest, I go to In-N-Out Burger because I'm from the East Coast and we don't have In-N-Out Burger. And uh, I think it's pretty good. And I that's pretty much the only burgers I eat during the year. So other than that, I'll eat like chicken burgers. So I hope that answers your question. Um, the only exception with w- Toughest Mudder starting at midnight, I try to eat my last meal at around 2.30 or 3 p.m. That way my body has time to process it uh, before the race starts because the first one I ate at final meal at like 5 p.m. And it's the only time in all of my ultra, in all of my racing period that I've ever had to stop and use the bathroom in the middle of a race. Uh, Number two, that is, right? Because we just pee in our wetsuits. Because that's a thing. 
All right, moving on. Uh, Jared Renier also wants to know how much do how much do you bench, bro? So I'll answer that. Uh, back when I was actually doing bodybuilding and powerlifting type training, I think I my max bench I want to say two sixty five or two seventy five. I'm not sure. It's on my website if you're really curious. You can go look it up. And that was probably at about one sixty five body weight. Now, earlier this year, doing some weighted dips, I ripped one of my, my right pec, so my bench is really low now. I think, I, I think the max I've benched since ripping my pec is 135 for probably a set of 10, maybe 6 or 8. I'm not even sure. Uh, basically, I'll, I'll do some bench press just to keep prevent muscle imbalances. I think that's going to help prevent some long-term injuries. Um, and... With the scar tissue in my chest now, as I start adding weight, I can start feeling it stretching and pulling. So I, I, I try not to go too heavy because um, I don't want to rip another muscle. However, luckily for OCR or for me, luckily for me, OCR does not is not very chest intensive. So I'm still doing, uh, you know, I still try to do some chest again to maintain some prevent some muscle imbalances and to prevent my chest from atrophying uh, too much. Jared, you're asking me a ton of questions here. Uh, Brian Fisher asks another Brian Fisher question: Best exercise you can do on a daily basis? Um, again, getting back to the, some of the stuff we talked about at the beginning, it really depends on what your current strengths and weaknesses are. So, the best exercise you can do on a daily basis is whatever your weaknesses is. So, for most people, I feel like that's going to be running. So, running is the best exercise. If um, you're coming from a running background, the best exercise would be pull-ups using rig grips, right? So like I said at the beginning, if you're falling off monkey bars, you can continue to do pull-ups on monkey on just regular bars. But if you're, if you consider yourself an experienced OCR athlete and you know, you can't, you're having trouble remembering the last time you fell off a monkey bar, stop doing pull-ups on monkey bars, start doing them on something else. Atomic climbing holds makes all these great grips. You take those, you throw them on a monkey, you throw them on a pull-up bar and now you're practicing rig training in addition to working on your back muscle and grip strength. I know Lauren Woodcock, one of the new members of the CTG Pro team, just put up a video of her doing pull-ups in her house with one of those doorway pull-up bars and two atomic climbing holds. So I'd say pull-ups would be the best answer for that. Uh, another Jared question. Should I rest for a period of my of time after my season to recoup from my intense OCR-specific training over the year, or am I good to keep going like I have all year? It really depends uh, on how much you've been training and racing all year. I have a very aggressive race schedule, and I think a lot of us do because this is fun and we really like to push our bodies to the limit. So I recommend taking some time off. At the end of every OCR season, I take a month off where I'm doing very little running. And I'm, for me, that's two to three times of running a week, anywhere between two and five miles, which is really low for me. And it's really at an easy pace. All I'm trying to do is keep that muscle memory of jogging in my brain and in my body. So when I transition back, it's not bad. But it allows all those nagging injuries to heal. And I really think prevents long-term, uh, long-term problems. So I've essentially made it, let's see, um, ran my first marathon in 2003, and I have never been seriously, I've never had any serious injuries in my lower body. So the my worst injury was that pec tear I just talked about, and that was in my upper body. But I've never had any serious lower uh, extremity injuries. And I think one of the reasons that's true is because I was bouncing back and forth between sports for a long time. So I would do four months of marathon running, four months of triathlon training, four months of powerlifting where I'd stop running completely, four months of bodybuilding where I'd start running a little bit again, adding in uh, mostly interval cardio, and then I'd go back to marathon running four months for four months. So there, there was periods of time where I didn't run at all for four months. And when you start running again after that, I'm not going to lie, it's pretty bad for about two weeks. Like, it feels terrible. But once you have that base underlying, like, system that allows you to run, you know, the more capillaries in your legs and the neuromuscular memory of that movement, it comes back pretty quick. So 
after OCR World Championships or after World's Toughest Mud or whatever your final race is of the year, I would take some time off. Let your mind and body recover. And I really think it's almost more important for your mind because it allows you to, you know, calm down, maybe loosen up your diet a little bit, and then you start hitting it hard again a month later. So I do recommend... I guess, so I guess I do recommend everyone takes a little bit of time off. Um, yeah. Uh, let's move down a little bit. Chris uh, Pasanisi, any training suggestions for doing the Tough Mudder 8-hour race when the furthest uh, he has gone is a half marathon? So with the 8-hour race, you know, there's plenty of people who go out there and walk a large portion of the race and that's that's okay you can do that now um, if you're looking to be competitive you're gonna want to build up your ability to run for longer and longer distances so like I talked about earlier back-to-back long runs is gonna be crucial and you want to slowly inch up your mileage over the course uh, between now and whenever your eight-hour races you know so if you're not racing until you know May you want to build, in general, I like to build volume and intensity for three weeks and then do a week of lower running volume. Build volume and intensity for three weeks, week of lower running volume. That allows you to add stress and then that lower running volume week allows you to consolidate those gains and make uh, improvements overall. Uh, now with the eight hour race, part of it is gonna be, it's gonna be just mental, right? Like how Let's say you ran your half marathon in two hours. I'm just just guessing here. I have absolutely no idea. So if that's way too low or way too high, I apologize. But the biggest problem you're going to have is, right, so you're looking at an eight-hour event, uh, which can be insurmountable for some people. So I would recommend, you know, working your way up to that distance over the course of several months and really years. Um, I can run for eight hours nonstop, but that's because I've been – running for a long time i didn't i didn't just step out my house one day and was like oh wow i can run for eight hours that was cool um so you really want to build it slowly up over time and you know it's it's baby everything's baby steps you're chipping away at that eight hour time mark right so you know you know maybe two years ago i could only run for six hours and two years before that maybe i could only run for four hours um and two years before that maybe only three right so um Slowly add volume. Uh, be safe about it. Um, yeah, and then kind of since I'm kind of bouncing around, anytime, like so, my book is going to be a great resource, and I'm not saying that just because I wrote it, <laughs> but because part of the reason I wrote it was I always want to explain things in depth, right? And there's there's never there's typically not a simple answer to whatever question you're looking for. There's a lot of background and amplifying information. And that's really why I wrote the book because people were asking me questions and it's like, well, here's your answer you're looking for, but there's a lot more, a lot more information that is the, is the reason that's true. So the book provides a great baseline uh, for you to start your training off of. And then from that, you know, it gives you the, that, that book gives you the foundations. So I like running my own training. So, um, and if you're that type of person, that book will give you that capability. But if you're not the type of person who wants to write your own training, uh, the, the book has plans in there. And then also, those plans are generic, right? So not, ev- not they're not going to be perfect for every athlete. So I do recommend, if you're really serious about obstacle course racing, is find a trainer, Jared Renier, who's, who's thrown a couple of softball questions at me. Uh, if you're in the Kansas City area, he trains a lot of OCR athletes out there. So he's a good resource to reach out to. And then... Obviously, there's uh, plenty of other resources out there, but the best training you're going to get is personalized, right? So if you want the if you want the cheapest solution, my book is 100% the way to go, right? It's $15, bam, you pick it up, you have your training plans. If you want a slightly more personalized plan, but it's still fairly generic, you know, there are programs like um, Gansy Camp where he's writing training plans for someone else and you're mimicking their training plan. Um, and then if you want really specific training, which should get you to the best results, you know, finding a personal trainer is going to be the way to go for that because they can look at – they can interact with you on a daily basis or weekly basis and be like, all right, here's where you're having trouble. 
here's where we need to go, here's where we need to tweak the training plan. I do write training plans for people. Uh, there's some information on that off my website, but I typically only carry like one or two athletes at a time just because with the amount of time and how busy I am, I don't have that much time to really put in the volume of work and effort I would really like to. Uh, but I again, I do occasionally train people. Uh, it's mostly online, and it's basically I send you a workout plan, and you follow it and give me feedback, and you know we talk on the phone, and I answer your questions, stuff like that. Um, on our side, kind of like Yancey Camp, we also have the Strength and Speed Developmental Team. So it's a private Facebook group. You can sign up for that. I post weekly workouts in there. There's a whole bunch of experts in there. Um, we have a nutritionist, nutritionist in there, Jared, another trainer's in there. I'm in there. A couple of the CTG pro team guys and girls are in there. Got a who else? A pro female, ex pro female boxer in there. Kevin Riggy, who finished third at Tough Motor X, is in there. A couple others. So um, it provides a good resource. So instead of asking a question to a large group on Facebook where you're getting all sorts of crazy answers, you ask a question in there. People, we generally agree. I'd say 90% of the time. And if, if it's not 100, 90, it's not a, I'd say that other 10%, it's, the answers are really close to each other. It's like, all right, well, you know, that could work. Here's another technique. They both have, you know, significant results. Uh, my friend Matt from high school asked, well, he said quantum mechanics. Um, that's not in the form of a question, Matt, so I'm, I'm not going to answer that. Um, moving on, Sean Langworthy. I started OCR in 2015, and this year I've started get really training to do better, mainly in rig type obstacles. My goal for next year is to do more competitive level running, and I want to be able to keep my band at them. How should I prioritize my training to become more technically proficient in OCR? He also said, "Love your book." I asked him in response because I wanted some more clarifying information. Uh, anything else besides rig you're concerned about, and what does your training currently look like? He says, "Mostly rigs I'm concerned about, and kept my band." All the way up to the last rig at USOCRC, but my hands were ripped open from uh, racing, so I couldn't get past it. Training schedule is mostly running in free weights. My gym doesn't have much else when I'm able to afford, and I'm unable to afford larger gyms like CrossFit or the like. So for upper body, I've been doing a lot of pull-ups, dead hangs from bars, and rock climbing grips. So I think that's a good base um, to, keep, to maintain to get more technically proficient at OCR, like we talked about at the beginning, specificity. The more specific your training is, the better it's going to be. Since you're training, since Sean, you're training a lot in the gym, um, I would, like I talked about at the beginning, use the rig grips, you know, set up a rig in the gym, and you're going to have to get creative. So I've used the cross beam of one of those pulling machines and set up my rig there, and people look at you like you're weird, but, you know, you just do your work and then step off to the side and let people use the pulley machine and then jump back in. I've set them up uh, inside of a squat rack, so across the top beams of a squat rack and traversed kind of like in a square. Um, Pull-up bars mounted to the wall. I've used that. I've used monkey bars to set up my rig. Um, yeah. The other thing I would say is, you know, whatever your weakness is, do that as your first exercise of the day. So your first exercise of the day, your, your, body, your muscles are still fresh. So I would start my training with that. Um, and then again, use the rig grips in other exercises you're doing. So instead of using, like I said, with the lat pull-down machine, but it can go beyond that, right? So instead of doing, if you're doing curls or something, right? Instead of using the bar, use a nunchuck and do curls with that. Instead of doing tricep kickbacks, um, with the, a rope, you know, you can use, again, a nunchuck. If you're using weights for a lot of your exercises, pick up a pair of Harbinger fat bar grips. So it's a rubber sleeve that goes over the handle of the bar, and it allows you to work on grip strength in between what, while doing other exercises. So whether you're doing a chest exercise, a shoulder exercise, a, you know, farmer's carries, whatever it is, it's also working your grip strength at the same time, requiring you to grab a uh, thicker thicker bar there. And then it, with OCR, you really got to get creative. So uh, another good thing I do is plate pinches or lobster claws, as Jared likes to call them. 
So you grab two plates in each hand. You know, if, if you're in like a more of a CrossFit type place, they have the bumper plates you can use of various thicknesses. If not, you can just grab like two tens and you pitch them together and do walks around the around the gym. I've also added those into my workout routine. So maybe I'm, you know, like I said, I, I, I like doing a lot of bodybuilding type movements. So I'll do a lot of bodybuilding type movements, but then I'll grab two plates in between a set and walk, do a lap around the gym and then go back to my exercise. So always kind of focusing on grip strength. And then if your gym really doesn't have anything, go to a playground. They have, you know, swing sets, have a, a cross beam across the top. Uh, sometimes there's monkey bars at the playground and you can set up your rig there and practice there and practice traversing back and forth. I think that should be pretty good. Sean, if, I didn't, if you don't think I answered your question good enough over the course of this podcast, just hit me up on Facebook again and I'll uh, try to provide a better answer there. Uh, Robert Bondoni, can you talk about off-season base building? This is my first season attempting to prep for two five-milers next June and would, would, would want to come in competitive. Um, so with all these questions, it's, hard, it's a little bit harder without knowing all of your background training history. But So if, he's, if your focus is on two five-milers next June, you have, you have a lot of time to prep for it. So for off-season or for base building, you know, I would take on a, just start running easy aerobic runs and do it consistently. I think consistently, consistency, um, volume, and time really build build that ability to run fast. So I know for me personally, you know, back in 2003, my first marathon time was like 4:20. I'm gonna go with eight, something like that. And over the course of the last, you know, 14 years, you know, I've I've been consistent, and a lot of my peers. You know, were faster than me uh, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, and they get they just got tired of training or got distracted by other things in life, which is fine. But I've stayed focused and continued to add volume or continue to add intensity, continue to cause some sort of stress to my body that causes an adaptation. You know, your body will respond to whatever you're telling it to do. So if you get to a certain level where you know you run five miles every day. Um, and then you you're never you never ask it to run faster, longer, you know, or harder. Your body will stop adapting, and it'll be like, all right, I have all the systems in place to run five miles. We're good, and we're just kind of ma- maintained from here. Um, again, sorry, strain off topic. So, the answer I would say is just consistency. So run, you know, three to five times a week, depending on your training history. Um, do a lot of easy aerobic runs for the next couple of months because you want to build that aerobic base. Uh, there's a chart that I have from Runner's World that I can post, or if someone messes me, I'll, I'll mess me to remind me, and I'll post it to my Facebook page. It shows how much of your aerobic system you're using for various distances, and even at something as short as a 5K, it's still like 92% aerobic. So what that means is, if you do have a lot of aerobic training, you're training that 92%. And that's going to build things like capillaries in your legs. It's going to make your your body more efficient at running. It's going to, you know, that easy running is going to allow you to run more frequently, which will, you know, help things with like your muscles. You know, the, the, the muscles on the opposite side of your body that aren't being used will be more relaxed while the other ones are being engaged a little bit harder. So it basically makes you more efficient is the, um, the short answer. And then, uh, Robert, as you get closer to your race in June – you know, you want to start adding in those interval workouts like I talked about at the beginning of the podcast. Um, so you can – my book has some training plans in there. You can use one of those as a base uh, and then just not do the obstacle-specific portions, and that that will give you a you know decent training plan for prepping for a running race. I think one of the problems with a lot of running magazines is – right, so they need to sell issues. So in order to sell issues, you got to constantly – you got to feed people what they want to hear. When at the end of the day, the sad part is it's it's consistency over time. You know, people want to how do I get faster? How do I get faster at this? And it's like, just keep running. It'll come. It'll it'll come eventually. And no one wants to wait that long. But that's how you get faster. You know, I've 
cut over an hour and I cut an hour and a half off my marathon time, um, which wasn't slow initially, right? So four twenty eight, like I said, and my current PR that I ran in two thousand fourteen is two fifty seven, and it was just grinding it out over time. Uh, Jack Bauer. If you ask most athletes, they'll say sports are 50% mental, yet most spend 95-plus percent of their training time improving their physical capabilities. Do you incorporate mental training into your programming? If so, what have you found has made the biggest difference in having a strong mental game? So a couple things with this. I actually just wrote an article for Iron Mind, um, a website that makes a lot of grip strength tools. Um, So pretty cool website if you want to check them out, ironmind.com. Stuff like uh, Captains of Crush clo- uh, grip trainers and then all sorts of various attachments. So that, sh- that article I wrote out should be out in their, I think, December issue of Milo, their uh, publication they put out regularly. So some of the things I – some of the – I'd say the mental training capable of things I do are – so the one is called mirror neurons, right? So if you watch someone do a, an activity, you actually get better at it. Because your brain sees what's going on and your brain fires like you're doing that activity. So if you're, you know, if you're having trouble at, with rigs, watch people, like go online and look at Ryan Atkins crossing the rig. Or, you know, I have a couple of rig uh, videos on my Facebook page or you know, any, any of the top guys and look at them go through the rig. You'll see they're, they're smooth and they're efficient. They're not making a lot of wild movements and they're moving quickly. Right, everyone. You only have so much grip strength in you, so you want to move smooth and slow and efficiently. So there's a saying in the military: it's uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So you want to. That's kind of what I use to apply to uh, rig uh, training. So mirror neurons is one. The second one I call is it, we can call it reminders or a vision board. So seeing reminders around where you live and work is going to help you stay focused on the task at hand. So I have pictures of some of my – we, we had a Conquer the Gauntlet Pro Team calendar. I had that on my desk at work. I also have uh, copies of my book there, which allowed me to mail them to people when they order them as quickly as possible. And then in my podcast room, I have all my trophies hung up or my medals. So they're actually separated into first, second, third, and then fourth through tenth. And then if I was outside of top ten, they're, they're in a, a smaller pile off to the side. But – you know, that positive reinforcement, you know, when I, every time I walk into that room, I see all the stuff I've accomplished, you know, it, it gives me that good feedback and it's like, all right, you, you can do this, you know, moving into future races, I can think about that room and it gives me confidence when I s- step on the starting line. Uh, like I talked about last week with Chris Maltby, you know, you show up to these races and there's like a thousand people and you're like, well, how am I going to do as well as I did last time? And a lot of it's like, all right, well, historically I've done well at you know, X, Y, and Z, so I should do well here too. So reminders is is number two. Um, number three is visualization. So there's a famous um, study done by Alan Richardson where he took basketball players or people who – he took people who were going to practice throwing free throws, and he had one group practice free they, – they, all, the, all three groups threw free throws – one group was allowed to practice uh, between the first and second testing. The other group did just visualization, and the third group did not, no visualization nor practice. The group that practiced the most did the best. The group that um, didn't practice or do visualization did the worst. Uh, not really. Uh, that's kind of what is expected. But what was weird was the group that did visualization did almost as well as the group that did actual practice. So if, if you can mentally rehearse going through things in your mind – and you don't want to just mentally rehearse, all right, I'm mentally rehearsing myself on the podium, right? Because that doesn't do anything. You want to mentally rehearse like you're physically going through the obstacles. I know I've watched um, some of the Ninja Warrior guys on TV, and you can see them doing it sometimes. They look at an obstacle, and you see them moving their hands back and forth and like changing their grip position. They're visualizing the event before it occurs. So their brain already has a a pathway that's telling it's what to do and then when they get on there they actually go through and do the action um and i honestly can't remember what the fourth one was that i wrote down in the article so i guess you're gonna have to go check that out but i know i I wrote down four 
Um, and then uh, I guess other than that, so the uh, what if what have you found has the, made the biggest difference in having a strong mental game? Um, part of it for me is history, uh, like I talked about with the reminders or the vision board. You know, I've done various things in my life that are hard, and I know I've gotten through those, so I can get through whatever race is facing me. Now, some of you may not have have a deep history of hard races or, you know, hard training or stuff like that, and that's fine because I think people have also gone through, you know, difficult things in their life, whether that be, you know, from the deep human interest side of, like, overcoming a disease all the way up to, like, right, everyone's had bad days where they're, you know, significant other broke up with them or maybe they went through a divorce or, um, you know, lost some friends due to some personal tragedy or their parents got the whatever it is right everyone's had bad days i think you know if you can get through some of that stuff it's i think it's harder than running around in a circle for a couple hours personally so look at yourself figure out what what you need to do to reach that level and then apply it for me personally you know i go into a lot of these endurance races with the attitude of like i'm not stopping until I black out, right? Like you can't, you can't stop me. As long as I'm fueling properly, as long as I've trained properly, I am fueling correctly. I'm just gonna keep going, and then if my bo- my body will shut down if it needs to. Um, you know, I say that with caution because, like I said, with you need to be, you need to have tr- proper training going in, and you need uh, proper fueling going in during the race, also, right? Because if you're not fueling properly, it's very easy to. Um, I don't say very easy it's easier to do damage to your body, like serious damage. So I go in there and my mantra, uh, which is morbid, so I don't really like to tell people it because it makes me sound like a psychopath, but my mantra going into these things is I'll I'll die out there, which, right, it sounds completely insane. Um, uh, As a military veteran, you know, I've, I've put my, I've gone to countries where like people are actively trying to hurt me um, so I feel like I've put my li- life on the line for some things that may not be super important to some other people. Um, and I don't know, that personally going in with that mindset um, helps me turn off a lot of these safety valves, right? So you're, you know, you're, before you ever do any sort of damage to your body, your body's going to send you all these signals that says, this hurts, please stop, let's stop doing this. And you can push past a lot of those mentally. Um, before you really start doing any anything serious to your body, and going in with that mindset of "I'll die out here," allows me to push past those and really get out the maximum level of performance that I'm capable of on that given day. Now, what, you know, am I really willing to die out there? No, of course not, right? Um, but that kind of mindset helps me in the middle of the race. Colton Wood asked, do you think people mentally fail races like the Ultra V's before they even start because they overthink it? Um, do I think people mentally fail races because they overthink it? Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, I will say I will say as long as you're, like I said earlier, as long as you're fueling, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, right? There's, there's, I feel like there's a certain amount of pride to be like, Hey, I didn't finish, but it's not because I quit during the race. It's because someone, you know, I didn't make a time cut off. I think there's a lot of pride in that. I've done a 24-hour adventure race uh, where we didn't make the time cut off. It was me and uh, one other guy, and we were we were just we were just moving too. Slow. He was moving too slow. I'm gonna dime him out. Uh, we were on a mountain bike, and he was he was not. I'm not a fast mountain biker, but he was moving very very slow. And we were about 20 hours into the event. And we kept moving all the way up until the point when we were, we were like an hour away from the time cutoff and clearly still very far away from it. So it was like, all right, we'll, we'll get a ride back now because otherwise we're going to get stuck out here for another uh, four hours. So I would say, yeah, I think, I mean, I think some people overthink it. Um, like I said, keep fueling and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And everything has an ending. Bilal Jamal, one of our friends from Lebanon, asks, are you attending OCR World Championships? And I am. I'm running the 15K and the relay. I will be wandering around the 3K that day with my daughter and my wife. So feel free to say hi. 
Should be a good time. I like the 3K race because it's super fun to watch. Everyone going head to head. I'm going to wrap this up. we got about uh, another five minutes. All right. Uh, last two questions from Matthew Puntin. Puntin? Sorry about that. What was one? Of, what is one of the hardest obstacles you've encountered? Not diet, training, etc. Actual an actual obstacle, such as Tarzan swing at Shell Hill or something else. So I, I would actually say Tarzan swing at Shell Hill is the hardest one I've personally encountered. Um, it's basically just a series of hanging ropes, um, probably about sixteen in a row, and you got to traverse from one to the other, which doesn't sound so bad. But it's right after a set of a really long set of flat monkey bars and a long set of uphill monkey bars. So your arms are all pumped out, and then you go right into that shortly after. And it's also like mile five of a six, of a five and a half of like a six mile course. So you're pretty tired. And then on top of that, every time I've gotten to it, it's been during Shell Hell or OCR America. So my body's already beat up pretty bad. So it usually does not go well for me. Uh, I will say. You know, obstacles, depending on your strength and your personal strength, you're going to have an easier time at some obstacles, an easier time at some obstacles than other. I think in general, the la- the hardest obstacle that's reoccurring is Pegatron at Conquer the Gauntlet. Um, and then if you, if you want to see some really hard obstacles, I know the guys from South Africa at Jeep Warrior Race have some pretty crazy rigs that are, like, super long. So I would check out... Uh, there's a South Africa OCR webpage or Facebook page, and they usually post videos on that that you can check out. And last question, again, from Matthew. Have you ever tried out for American Ninja Warrior? I have not tried out for American Ninja Warrior. So personally, I fall into a really weird category where if you can run farther than me, you probably can't do obstacles as well as I can. And if you can do obstacles better than I can, you probably can't run as far as I can. So... That puts me in a very weird cross section, uh, and, and I do well at World's Toughest Mudder and all these other ultra OCRs. But I, I, like, I won't go out and win an ultra race on the weekend because I'm not a pure runner, and I won't go out and win a Ninja Warrior competition because I'm not a pure Ninja athlete. I have thought about it just because the course looks like a lot of fun. I would actually be more inclined to run the course if it was not televised. And if I didn't have to submit a lengthy submission video uh, to get on the show, if I could just sign up and, you know, whatever, pay my money and get out there and run the course, I think that would be great. Um, the It is a TV show, as we talked about when Noah, Noah Kaufman was on the podcast um, earlier this year. So you do have to deal with a lot of the TV show, reality show type drama stuff with, you know, people taking union breaks and... Um, you know, you show up and you got to wait hours to run the course. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe if it comes to Kansas City again, I'll apply at some point. It's just not, not, not really my focus. Uh, it does look fun though, and everyone I know that's gone on the show, Lucas Fonensteel, Amy Pagic, all those people, Maggie Thorne, have all have you know nothing but good things to say about it. Um, but you need to go in there understanding it is a TV show, so. Plan on waiting around for several hours before you actually get to do your run. And there's absolutely no guarantee you'll get any airtime, right? Because they film 150 people, 30 get any sort of TV coverage, and out of those 30, maybe 10 get, you know, detailed backstories on the show. And it is, again, in the end of the day, it is a TV show. So I like, you know, I like the pure athletic competitions where it's a little less drama. So, you know, the t- I thought the toughest mutter series that they've been doing on cbs has been great they used a couple of my sentences on air for the philly episode hopefully i'll get a couple more sentences for the chicago episode and i really like those Uh, i like that they're you know they're filmed and they're they're filmed in such a way where they're not overly dramatizing it in my opinion um one of my critiques about the spartan show which i do give them a lot of credit because they were the first ones to get you know, the normal races on TV, on MB- NBC Sports, is they put things in slow motion or fast motion, like, unnecessarily. I think I watched one of the episodes from last year, and I actually timed it on my watch. And, you know, between the start of the show and the first commercial break, there was five minutes and ten seconds of altered time. So either sped up or slowed down. 
and a minute 45 of normal time where like they just showed you know people were moving at their normal pace um so i just just not a fan of the way it's shot i wish they would just cover it like a normal sports program like they do on the live feed like if we could take the live feed and cut it up a bunch and you know reshoot it and use the higher quality cameras and push that on nbc sports i would like personally i would like that a lot better rather than the you know it being like the movie 300 where everything's slow motion and it's like and i'm crawling out of the water and the water's dripping and it's like all right you're just leaving the water it's fine everyone's gonna be fine it's really not a big deal water obstacles are all over the place <laughs> so just my personal opinion on that well i think that about wraps it up that's an hour of me running my mouth if you like this episode and want more stuff like this, let me know, and we will do this occasionally. Obviously, this won't be a you know weekly occurrence of me just running my mouth, but uh, if, like I said, if you like it, let me know on Facebook, and we'll, we'll do this occasionally because this is super easy to schedule because I just sit down and start running my mouth. All right. Uh, I have to apologize to Amy Padgett. We recorded her episode weeks ago, and we keep pushing it off, and I think I'm going to push it off another week. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, Don't miss Amy Padgett coming on the show next week, talking about all her ninja awesomeness. And she's the only woman currently who's been on the overall podium of OCR World Championship and World's Toughest Mudder as an individual. So uh, stay tuned for some awesome information from her. She's also on the Conquer the Gauntlet Pro team and just an all-around cool person and a vet. We also have surpassed a milestone. I believe this is episode 30. So my goal when I started this podcast was to do an episode at least every other week. So with um you know, we we've surpassed that and the year's not over. So uh, thanks everyone for sticking with us. Make sure you share and spread the podcast so we can get more listeners and keep bringing you quality information. And if you like what you're hearing, you know, feel free to head to the teamstrengthspeed.com slash podcast section of our website. There's a donation link down in the corner. And you can throw us a couple of bucks. And we'd appreciate that. You know, this stuff does cost money to put out. So, you know, a couple bucks here or there will just help help keeping the uh, show going, help cover some costs. And then also if you want, if you want to give a special shout out, you can, you know, throw us a couple bucks. Write what you want us to say, and we'll give you a shout out on air. You know, or you know, you can wish your friends a happy birthday or good luck at a race, blah blah blah, etc. You want you want to you want to propose to your significant other on the Strength and Speed podcast? That'd be cool too. Uh, you know, whatever you want. So, all right, I will see all of you in Canada. It's going to be awesome. Adrian and his crew always put on an amazing race. So that's it. See you in Canada. Yeah.